Roger. Citizen, soldier. In the United States, the citizen soldier has a profound and cherished meaning. A meaning that goes back to well before our nation was even founded. Here in North Carolina, we can trace the National Guard back to the 1660s when colonial settlers were required to own a musket, powder, and shot in order to claim and protect land grants. Our citizen soldiers, then and now, reflect the core values of the North Carolina National Guard. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage, and excellence. In this short video, we will take a look at a relatively unsung hero and two little known events from early 19th century North Carolina history. We will examine General Benjamin Smith, the 16th governor of our state. We will also look at some interesting events in the War of 1812 and the Mexican War. Did you know that Hinton James was the first student on the University of North Carolina campus? He enrolled on February 12, 1795. A dormitory on the UNC campus is named in his honor. So you're probably wondering, why are we talking about this university? You will soon discover the answer when we talk about General Benjamin Smith. Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, J.K. Rowling, and Steve Jobs. What do these four all have in common? Well, they were all rags to riches stories. I'll bet you haven't heard of many riches to rags stories. One of our North Carolina Patriots did indeed go from riches to rags in his quest to aid his country and his state. Let's take a look at his life. Benjamin Smith was born in Charleston, well before the American Revolution, in the 1750s into a prominent South Carolina planter family. With the storm clouds of revolution growing, Smith joined the South Carolina militia and witnessed the rush to war. Numerous accounts of his military career indicate in mid-1776 he was an aide-de-camp for General George Washington. As is often the case in history, primary sources do not support this claim. He certainly did come of age during the Revolutionary War, and his experiences fanned his hatred of the British and his passion for a strong military. Picking up the story from here is North Carolina historian Ben Sorensen. In 1777, Benjamin Smith would marry Sarah Rhett Dry, the daughter of Colonel William Dry, the customs collector for the Port of Brunswick. They would spend the remainder of their lives living in North Carolina on her late father's estates, including Orton Plantation. By 1784, the citizens of Brunswick County knew him well enough to elect him state senator at the age of 27. He was to sit in Hillsborough with many of North Carolina's most favorite sons, Richard Caswell, Samuel Johnston, Willie Jones, Benjamin Williams, James Robertson, and Griffith Rutherford. Politics was in his blood. Smith was elected to the Continental Congress, was a member of the state constitutional convention that approved the new U.S. Constitution, and served for over 40 years as Justice of the Peace for Brunswick County. Here we are on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill, a place that Benjamin Smith loved. After having thoroughly established himself as a leader of the Tar Heel State, he dedicated his efforts to the education of his fellow citizens. When the University of North Carolina was chartered as America's first state-supported institution of higher learning, Benjamin Smith donated 20,000 acres of land in Tennessee that he had received for his service in the American Revolution. Smith served on the UNC Board of Trustees from its founding in 1789 until 1824, a full 35 years of service. He would continue to promote education throughout the rest of his life. When it came to education, Smith said, a certain degree of education should be placed within the reach of every child in the state.
including the poorest of every neighborhood in order to produce an enthusiastic attachment to their own country and ensure a jealous support of their own constitution, laws, and government. Our philanthropist was also in the militia. As Colonel of the Brunswick County Regiment, Smith urged the State Senate to action so that the militias would be aligned with new federal guidelines. Around the same time, Smithville was created near the mouth of the Cape Fear River, at the site of the old fort, we know as Fort Johnston. Smith was one of its commissioners and donated land for its establishment. Therefore, they even named the town after him. I bet many of you have been to Smithville before and you didn't even realize it. Because today, it's Southport. I'm sure you all are familiar with the Second Amendment, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Most people jump right to the second half, to support your right to bear arms. But the first half is equally as important. General Smith was a strong proponent of establishing a robust militia for the defense of his state. Do you recall the Chesapeake Leopard Affair in June of 1807? That was when the British naval vessel Leopard attacked and boarded the U.S. naval ship Chesapeake off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia. This British attack resulted in killing three American seamen, wounding 18 more, and their seizure of four men. Most Americans were outraged. Here in North Carolina, Smith and others again called for a stronger militia to defend our state against the might of the British Empire. Tar Heel Governor Nathaniel Alexander was ordered by President Thomas Jefferson to arm and equip 7,000 militiamen and prepare them for action. But it was not quite that simple. The units were disorganized and unprepared for action, in spite of the general working hard to organize the men. President Jefferson was no more prepared for war than North Carolina, so he found a more peaceful way to protest the British action. The Embargo Act of 1807 prevented all foreign trade, no matter who it was with. By 1810, General Smith became concerned with the rundown condition of Fort Johnston and interceded with the federal government for new barracks. He also added additional cannons, which he brought from Charleston at his own expense. 1810 was also a gubernatorial election year, and the general along with current Governor David Stone of Bertie County were the front runners. At this time, governors were not elected by popular vote. Instead, they were elected jointly by both houses of the General Assembly. On the fourth ballot, Major General Benjamin Smith finally won 97 to 85. He took the oath of office in Raleigh on December 5, 1810. In an address to the legislature in 1811, Smith spoke about the issues most dear to him. Education, internal improvements, reform of the state penal system, and especially the militia. Smith emphatically stated that the Tar Heel State would not have any peace or security if they were not willing to stand up and defend their rights. He said, to be prepared for war frequently ensures peace. He warned them about the extensive North Carolina coastline that needed protecting, especially Edenton, Ocracoke Inlet, and Cape Fear. Unfortunately, the legislature refused to act on any of his suggestions, even his proposal to better arm the militia. When Governor Smith decided not to run for a second term, he left Raleigh for private life in the Cape Fear region. During the War of 1812, a frustrated Benjamin Smith sat on the sideline. Smith found himself slowly but surely falling deeper and deeper into debt. It seemed like creditors were everywhere and his rice crop didn't produce enough revenue to meet the bills. He and his wife were even running out of food. In 1820, to relieve some of his debt, he relinquished Mallory Plantation, the Blue Banks Plantation, and Bald Head Island to the United States government. Unfortunately, his final years were spent in his dilapidated home in Smithville. In 1821, his wife died. And five years later, so did the general. So what are we to make of Benjamin Smith's life? No rags to riches tale here, but rather his saga is a riches to rags story. 
but no one should ever question his love of country and his dedication to the Tar Heel State. Smith's passion for the University of North Carolina and education in the state at all levels is to be admired and praised. UNC honored their first donor by naming one of the most beautiful buildings on campus after him. During World War II, the Liberty ship SS Benjamin Smith was launched in Wilmington and saw service in the Atlantic. Benjamin Smith's sense of honor, devotion to family, his charity, and his selfless service stand as an exemplary model for all of us today. Heads up! Here's something to figure out! During the War of 1812, we all know that the public buildings in Washington, D.C. were burned. What was this in retaliation for? A. The U.S. Army's raid and looting of York, the capital of Upper Canada. B. The killing of Indian Chief Tecumseh. C. U.S. Army's defeat of the British in Canada. Or D. It was not in retaliation for anything. The answer is A. An American force attacked York, Canada on April 17, 1813. They set fire to the Parliament buildings during their five-day occupation. The burning of Washington, D.C. by the British was in revenge for this act. On March 5, 1834, York reverted back to its original Indian name, Toronto, the Iroquois term for where there are trees in water. So, what do you know about the War of 1812? You may recall that this was not fought just in 1812, but continued until 1815. Back in the 1950s, Johnny Horton even wrote a song about it. As I'm sure you know, there were numerous causes for the War of 1812, especially the impressment of our sailors. President James Madison wanted to send a clear message to the British. Enough. When Madison asked Congress for a declaration of war, Congress quickly agreed, and we went to war against the greatest power in the world. The call went out to the states to assemble their militias. Remember, Governor Benjamin Smith had a hard time getting permission to raise a militia earlier in his term from 1810 to 1811. But now, America was at war. New Governor William Hawkins had more flexibility to raise a North Carolina militia to protect his fellow Tar Heels. While the states were busy raising their militias, the federal government needed to raise an army fast. In charge of recruiting for the U.S. Army in North Carolina was Major William S. Hamilton, who would rise to the rank of Colonel. He promised to equip volunteers in rifle dress and give you your favorite weapon. You will cover yourselves with glory. What was their pay to be? It ranged from eight to twelve dollars per month, plus a hundred and twenty-four dollar bounty for enlisting, and a hundred and sixty acres of free land when the war was over. The land was certainly enticing. <coughs> Tar Heel men flocked to the call from all over the state. One estimate claimed 1,200 men from North Carolina volunteered for the regular army. Those who did not enlist in the army, but still were willing to help the war effort, joined the North Carolina militia as citizen soldiers. The number of militiamen from North Carolina willing to fight the British actually reached 7,000. Meanwhile, the British Navy had blockaded the eastern coast of the United States. They had naval superiority on both the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico. America might have bitten off more than it could chew. We're on a ferry crossing the Pamlico Sound, one of the largest inland saltwater bodies in the world. Along the North Carolina coast, the federal government was slow to equip the militias or defend the coast in the early 1800s. There was a lot of excitement along the coast during the war especially in Ocracoke and Portsmouth. In order to counteract the British blockade, quick, shallow draft ships called revenue cutters sailed to North Carolina ports. These brave sailors kept commerce alive as well as harassing the British Navy. One such cutter was the Mercury. 
She was named after the Roman god of speed, commerce, and financial gain, and she surely lived up to her name. On May 21st, 1813, the British privateer, the Venus of Bermuda, tried to attack the Mercury while she was anchored offshore here at Ocracoke on the Outer Banks. The local Tar Heel Patriots, though, they detected the plot. They raised the alarm before the British privateer could spring its trap. The Mercury was able to escape due to its superior speed. Its captain, David Wallace, knew the waters. Because he was a native of the Outer Banks, he knew every shoal and inlet. The Mercury again saved the day, this time on July 13, 1813. A Royal Navy squadron appeared off Ocracoke, hoping to capture the Mercury and sail into Pamlico Sound. 1,000 British officers and enlisted men in 15 armed barges captured two American privateers on the Outer Banks, but the Mercury was able to escape. She escaped with the local money and customs records for safekeeping and sailed across the Pamlico Sound to New Bern and warned the city. A shudder of fear and anticipation ran all along the entire coast. The New Bern militia and citizen soldiers from the eastern part of North Carolina were rapidly called out. The British squadron rethought its plans and decided not to attack the city. Captain David Wallace and the Mercury had saved North Carolina from a possible British invasion. Newburn's paper, the Carolina Federal Republican, wrote, Captain David Wallace of the Revenue Cutter merits the highest praise for his vigilance, address, and good conduct in getting the cutter away from the enemy and bringing us the most speedy intelligence of our danger. So, our loyal Tar Heels answered the call to duty with great personal courage and selfless service, sometimes with their lives. In time of need, you can always count on the good citizens of the Tar Heel State. Did you know that New Bern in Craven County was settled in 1710 by Swiss and German immigrants? The new colonists named the settlement after Bern, the capital of Switzerland. New Bern is the second oldest European American colonial town in North Carolina and the first permanent capital of our state. At one time, it was even called the Athens of the South. In fact, I'll bet you didn't know that it's also the birthplace of Pepsi Cola. Now in Pepsi, for those who think yeah. There are times when our citizen soldiers are called to take up arms and travel outside of our state and even outside of our nation. One of our first international conflicts was with Mexico. Here we are on the grounds of the state capitol at a statue honoring three North Carolina-born U.S. presidents, Andrew Johnson, Andrew Jackson, and our 11th president, James K. Polk. After Polk's election, Congress promptly passed a joint resolution admitting Texas into the Union. This action would eventually lead to a declaration of war on our neighbors to the South on May 13, 1846. During this period, the North Carolina militia, in spite of the best efforts of leaders like General Benjamin Smith, was still poorly armed and led. They were relegated to mostly patrol duties. By the first week of March, 1847, a North Carolina regiment, as part of the U.S. Army, departed for the Southwest. As events transpired, our regiment never saw combat but suffered from disease, frustration, and boredom rather than enemy bullets. President Polk sent an invasion force under the command of General Winfield Scott to the Mexican port of Veracruz. There, the general conducted the first successful major amphibious assault in U.S. history. It is significant to note that many of the young officers in the Mexican War would be senior leaders in the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, George Meade, James Longstreet, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, and our own future Tar Heel General Braxton Bragg. Fighting against General Scott was President and Commander of the Mexican Forces, none other than General Antonio de Santa Anna. Yeah, the guy who 11 years before led the Mexican forces at the Battle of the Alamo and lost to the Texans at San Jacinto. He was back. 
After his successful amphibious assault, Scott marched his troops under very harsh conditions towards the Mexican capital. Along the way, the Tar Heels of G Company, 12th U.S. Infantry, particularly distinguished themselves at a battle called Puente Nacional, or National Bridge, on August 12, 1847. Around 11 o'clock, the regiment arrived at National Bridge and Wilmingtonian Lieutenant H.B. Sears led the first group across. It was an ambush. Every man on the bridge was killed or seriously wounded by rifle and cannon fire, except Sears. Lieutenant Sears was joined by another North Carolinian, Lieutenant Edward Cantwell of Washington, North Carolina, along with 12 enlisted men. They charged the offending cannon and destroyed it. The bridge was then quickly captured. Our brave Tar Heels had fought well. General Scott moved forward, and after a few more engagements, approached Mexico City. Eventually, Santa Ana decided to evacuate the city to save it from bombardment. U.S. forces then advanced. For all intents and purposes, the Mexican War was over. Unfortunately, the prominent state senator and popular commander of the 12th Infantry, Colonel Lewis D. Wilson, succumbed to disease during the war. In his honor, Wilson County, North Carolina, and the town of Wilson were both named for him. The Wilmington Journal reflected upon the service of our brave Tar Heel soldiers. They deserve the gratitude and thanks of the state just as much as if they had been in every battle. Governor William Graham added, they bore their full share of privations and hardships incident to camp life. Whether the U.S. was right or wrong in fighting the Mexican War is still debated. The state regiment and our men in the 12th U.S. Infantry gave us a place of honor in the war with Mexico. Their selfless sacrifice, loyalty, and personal courage did us all proud. Heads up. Okay, here's another heads up challenge. What was flying artillery? A. They were cannons floated above the battlefield in balloons for a better view. B. They were light cannons attached to two-wheeled ammunition boxes called caissons and pulled by horses. C. They were cannons flying the flag of our nation. Or D. It's a book about the Chudley Cannons Quidditch team. If you said D, well, you're an expert on Harry Potter. Harry read about the Chudley Cannons before falling asleep and having a vision involving Lord Voldemort. But the real answer is B. Originally developed in Europe by Gustavus Adolphus and Frederick the Great, the United States used these mobile cannons effectively in the Mexican War. So what does this all mean to us today? Well, remember, Benjamin Smith fought for a prepared militia and quite often was rebuffed. In both the War of 1812 and the Mexican War, our state and nation were woefully unprepared and our citizen soldiers suffered for it. Today, our National Guard ensures that in times of peace we are prepared for war, and in times of calm, we are prepared for natural disasters. With solid core values, our citizen soldiers stand ready for any contingency that may arise. They are primed to protect our Tar Heel way of life and the freedoms we enjoy today. Thank <laughs> you.